Hello, my name is Professor David Andrew Tizard and welcome to the first uh, class here for a course in world history, which is for Hanyang University in Seoul, South Korea. Obviously, we're all getting used to this online functions, so I hope you cope with it as best you can. At the end of the lecture, I'll give you some uh, information about the assignment and what is expected of you uh, as a student online. So that will come at the end. For now, I'd just like to get into the lecture as much as possible without a long introduction. For this course on world history, uh, I'm not going to take you chronologically through uh, the beginning of time until the current day. I think that would be boring and uh, I think we would often miss out on a lot of good stuff and, and get bogged down in, in things that perhaps you already know about or perhaps that have been covered a lot elsewhere. Just like the thoughts that appear in our head, uh, we're going to sort of jump around a timeline and see if we can't build a bigger, more complete jigsaw of world history. Before we do that, though, we need to know what history is and more importantly, how we can look at history. And so to start off, we're going to uh, analyze chapter one of E.H. Carr's uh, famous book, What is History? I, I highly encourage you to read the whole book. Also, uh, E.H. Carr's The 20 Years Crisis is a fantastic piece of reading. E.H. Carr was a diplomat, a historian, a journalist, editor. Uh, he, he was many great things. Uh, one interesting thing about What is History, this book that we will uh, study and chapter one today is that it was actually banned in South Korea. Of course, you know, Karl Marx's capital and things like that were banned in South Korea because of the anti-communist uh, approaches of the military governments from uh, Park chung hee and then Chandu won uh, But this book as well, What is History, was banned in South Korea until uh, perhaps the 1980s, uh, mid to late 1980s, I believe. So you're reading something or you're studying something here that wouldn't have been able or open for you to do, let's say, a couple of generations ago. So you, that's what you need to consider, how much history does change. Yes, South Korea is still in the same geographical place, but a couple of generations ago, this book might have put you in a prison cell in Namsan or something like that. So if that doesn't make you excited about reading it, I'm not sure what else would, but you also want to consider, well, why was this banned? You might find something. Uh, just before I start reading through uh, chapter one of Carr's work, I would encourage you, if you haven't read it yet, stop the video, press pause, go and read it by yourself. Because if you read it by yourself, you're going to highlight certain things, you're going to underline bits that I necessarily might not pay attention to, uh, because that's just how it goes. And it changes every time you read it. And so if you haven't read it yet, go and read it yourself and then come back and compare what you noticed about it with what I'm going to highlight from it. That would be my suggestion. OK, if we uh, start by looking at this, the title, well, the, the book itself is called What is History? It's a, a fantastic question, Re because you know what history is. But if you had to describe history, you know, when does history begin? Is history yesterday? Well, that doesn't seem like history, but is history then 10 years ago, 100 years ago? When does history begin and, and what counts as history? It's a very important question. Uh, Carr starts this with the, uh, the title of chapter one, which is The Historian and His Facts. So you notice that we're getting the relationship between uh, the individual. By the way, I'm using a, a mouse to do this, so if it looks pretty bad, that's why. The individual in the world, right? That's the relationship that Carr seems to be drawing out in chapter one. How do people interpret the world? How do we as individuals interpret what goes on? And, and Carr had his own opinions about that. And you notice this pr pronoun here, it's the historian and his facts. It's not the facts, but rather they are his facts that belong to him or belong to her. And so that kind of introduces this idea of subjectivity, yeah? which is not something we normally associate with history, or it certainly, you know, traditionally wasn't associated with history. Uh, 
So that gives you a little idea of where Carr is going to go with this. Uh, let, let's, let's move on and see where we get to. What is history? Lest anyone think the question meaningless or superfluous, I will take as my text two passages relating respectively to the first and second incarnations of the Cambridge modern history. Here is Acton in his report of October 1896 to the syndics of the Cambridge University Press on the work which he had undertaken to edit. It is a unique opportunity of recording, in the way most useful to the greatest number, the fullness of the knowledge which the 19th century is about to bequeath. By the judicious division of labour we should be able to do it and to bring home to every man the last document and the ripest conclusions of international research. Ultimate history we cannot have in this generation, but we can dispose of conventional history and show the point we have reached on the road from one to the other, now that all information is within reach and every problem has become capable of solution. So this was uh, Lord Acton, <clears throat> famous for that pithy quote, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see that already he's highlighting uh, a utilitarian aspect here, okay? Uh, utilitarian, exactly this. Recording in the way most useful to the greatest number. So utilitarianism, something, uh, you know, uh, the, of which uh, Jeremy Bentham, among others, was a proponent of uh, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So, you know, really focusing on the majority. If, if something benefits 52% of the population, not 48, well, that's what it is, yeah? Um, he also has this very kind of ideal uh, vision of history in that every problem will have a solution and it will be able you will be able to solve it once enough information is there so nothing is beyond the reach of people it's it's all about just approaching things rationally increasing your information and the more information and data and facts that you have then you will be able to solve the problems. You will be able to understand all of man's problems. So Lord Acton has a sort of utilitarian and slightly idealistic part. Um, this is kind of a nice illustration of history to show the point we have reached on the road from one to the other. Yeah, so if you imagine history as sort of being a line like this, I know this is the predominantly uh, Western view of history as, as a linear progression. It's a little bit ethnocentric, but let's start with that because that's where Carl was from. And, um, you know, history shows we've come from this point to this point. So, you know, history is the bits in between. Uh, this is what Acton is saying here. So that's what E.H. Carr starts with. Where does he continue with George Clark? And almost 60 years later, Professor Sir George Clark, in his general introduction to the second Cambridge modern history, commented on his on this belief of Acton and his collaborators that it would one day be possible to introduce ultimate history and went on. Historians of a later generation do not look forward to any such prospect. They expect their work to be superseded again and again. They consider knowledge of the past has come down through one or more human minds, has been processed by them, and therefore cannot consist of elemental and impersonal atoms which nothing can alter. The exploration seems to be endless and some impatient scholars take refuge in scepticism, or at least in the doctrine that, since all historical judgments involve persons and points of view, one is as good as another and there is no objective historical truth. So in the period of 60 years, in a 60 year change, you notice that we've gone from the, the idealism of which every problem will have a solution uh, from Acton and then uh, Professor Clark saying uh, 60 years later that, you know, it's no longer idealist. There's been a change because, and this is why, knowledge of the past has come down through human minds. And here's this word, it has been processed by them. So it's been interpreted and it's been analyzed by a human mind, which is, uh, by necessity, I, I guess, at the time, is subjective. You know, it's not objective. It's not a computer where you put two plus two equals four, but it's been processed by a human mind and we have you know, subjectivity, free will to a certain extent, which then deals with this information. So history is not created by impersonal atoms that stay universal through time. 
so the, the view of history had changed but what of that so then what happens if there is no idea of an ultimate history you know, this ultimate history which was this view here then what are you left with well if you're impatient it's a key word there if you're impatient uh, says Clark some scholars take refuge in skepticism or at least in the doctrine that well since we can't have objective history since that can't happen because it comes through humans then everything must be as good as everything else that everything must be equal and you see here that Clark is sort of you know decrying that as an impatient position it might be one of the uh, the tropes or the ideas that you see in post-modernity where there is no subjective uh, sorry where there's no objective truth and so every uh, truth is equal to the other uh, Clark is saying that's an impatient idea perhaps correctly there that not everything becomes equal just because there is no ultimate truth that can be gained in history so hopefully you get this idea that what is history has been interpreted many different ways by many different people over history Carr gives you two examples there um, let's let's go on a little bit further <clears throat> where the pundits contra contradict each other so flagrantly the field is open to inquiry. I hope that I'm sufficiently up to date to recognize that anything written in the 1890s must be nonsense, but I'm not yet advanced enough to be committed to the view that anything written in the 1950s necessarily makes sense. Indeed, it may have already occurred to you that this inquiry is liable to stray into something even broader than the nature of history. The clash between Acton and Sir George Clarke is a reflection of the change in our total outlook on society over the interval between these two pronouncements. Acton speaks out of the positive belief, the dear-eyed self-confidence of the latter Victorian age. Sir George Clarke echoes the bewilderment and distracted scepticism of the Beat generation. When we attempt to answer the question, what is history? Our answer, consciously or unconsciously, reflects our own position in time and forms part of our answer to the broader question, what view we take of the society in which we live. I have no fear that my subject may, on closer inspection, seem trivial. I am afraid only that I may seem presumptuous to have broached a question so vast and so important. So he's breaking it down to the very thing that it goes beyond history. That when somebody looks at history, it strays into something even broader. And what it does when you try to answer the question, what is history, it consciously or subconsciously tells you or gives an indication to your own position in time and how you view the current society okay so if person a uh, let's say lives in Seoul in 2020 and person B uh, lives where shall we say uh, in uh, Rio in 1890 how they answer the question what is history will not tell us as much about history as it will tell us about them at that time and how they view the society in which they're living okay so that's what Carr is suggesting here that how you look at history is a reflection of the time in which you live and how you approach society so for example, and it might be a controversial example, but you can see uh, perhaps what you make of it. If somebody, and there have been many of them, were to look into, say, a feminist view of history and, and try to see the world uh, through the eyes of a patriarchy and that everything has been, you know, written and controlled and dominated by men, of course, there might be uh, a lot of truth in that. I don't think it would be the whole truth, but there would definitely be some grounds for that argument. What that would tell you, however, is the person doing that history has, you know, come across that in their own time and in their own society. That that view, that theoretical or approach that they take to history would be a reflection of how they're living their life at that time and in relation to society. So now you get this idea that history is connected to the historian. It's the historian and his facts the person and the world 
and the relationship between these two people. But as Clark suggested, we shouldn't say that, you know, all historians are equal in that time. I'll continue. <clears throat> The 19th century was a great age for facts. What I want, said Mr. Gradgrind in hard times, is facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. 19th century historians on the whole agreed with him, and Ranke in the 1830s in legitimate protest against moralizing history remarked that the task of the historian was simply to show how it really was. This not very profound aphorism had an astounding success. Three generations of German, British, and even French historians marched into battle, intoning the magic words Voice Heiglintik Gewesen, like an incantation designed, like most incantations, to save them from the tiresome obligation to think for themselves. The positivists, anxious to stake out their claim for history as a science, contributed the weight of their influence to this cult of facts. First, ascertain the facts, said the positivists, then draw your conclusions from them. In Great Britain, this view of history fitted in perfectly with the empiricist tradition, which was the dominant strain in British philosophy from Locke to Bertrand Russell. The empirical theory of knowledge presupposes a complete separation between subject and object. Facts, like sense impressions, impinge on the observer from outside and are independent of his consciousness. The process of reception is passive. Having received the data, he then acts on them. The Oxford Shorter English Dictionary, Dictionary, a useful but tendentious work of the empirical school, clearly marks the separateness of the two processes by defining a fact as a datum of experience as distinct from conclusions. This is what may be called the common sense view of history. History consists of a corpus of ascertained facts. The facts are available to the historian in documents, inscriptions and so on, like fish on the fishmonger's slab. The historian collects them, takes them home, and cooks and serves them in whatever style appeals to him. Acton, whose culinary tastes were austere, wanted them served plain. In his... Okay, let's, uh, let's just stop here because we've gone through quite a lot. So, uh, Charles Dickens, hard times. Facts, facts, just the facts, all I want are facts. So, um, there was a protest against moralizing history. And you have to question this, you know, history that tries to moralize or... Uh, paint a particular view um, of good and bad, you have to question why would history try to moralize? And can you think of any examples of that? What would be the benefit of moralizing in history? Would What would be any uh, drawbacks or disadvantages of moralizing in history? So how does moralizing history work? You can certainly see in, in South Korea that, <clears throat> you know, any explorations into history are generally very fraught. Uh, they have to be, whether it's looking at uh, Japanese colonization, whether it's looking at uh, Gwangju, uh, things like this, history can be very difficult, can be very dangerous. And so, apart from moralizing history, which was, uh, you know, was very prominent, then came this idea that you just need the facts. The task of the historian was to simply show how it really was. This idea that you could show everything very clearly. Yeah, and so this came with the sort of the posit uh, positivists or the empiricists. Look what Carr says <clears throat> about them. Three generations of these people marched into battle. These historians marched into battle saying we need to show how it really was like an incantation. And they did this to save themselves from the obligation to think. They didn't want to think. So this is Carr being quite critical here, saying that if you're just trying to find facts, if you're just trying to find data and datum, then you are not thinking for yourself. You're not interpreting it for yourself. OK, so there was a movement, you know, to make history like a science. You see those movements today in other fields and schools, things like international relations, uh, politics, political science. But, you know, can it compare? Can these subjects compare with the sciences where you have data and you do tests? You have dependent and independent variables to understand the way the world works around us. There's a move to get many fields into <clears throat> science. 
One of those was to get history in there. Uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, you know, very famous for his writing, a, a pr uh, prominent atheist, you know, very much against the spiritual world because it couldn't be proved. He was a mathematician, friend of Wittgenstein, um, opponent of war. He spent some time in prison because of his oppositions uh, to the the war of the, the First World War, I believe it was. Um, <clears throat> we get this fish idea, okay? So um, the facts are available to the historian in documents, inscriptions, and so on. So the facts are available in documents and inscriptions. We have to go and get the facts. And he compares this to like fish on a fishmonger's slab. We go and we get the facts that we want from the various places, the library, the textbooks, the documents, and so on. And then we come home with our facts and we make what we want from these facts. So, uh, you know, facts are like fish on the fishmonger's slab. Let's see where he goes. And, you know, certain people want these facts served plain with no dressing. So Acton, who was austere, he says, um, when you serve up these facts, don't put any dressing on them. Don't make them colorful. Don't make them taste nice. Just show how it was without any interpretation. It's one view of what history should be. Um, <clears throat> in his letter of instructions to contributors to the first Cambridge uh, modern history, he announced the requirement that our Waterloo must be one that satisfies French and English, German and Dutch alike, that nobody can tell without examining the list of authors where the Bishop of Oxford laid down the pen and where the Fairbairn or Gasquet, Liberbarn or Harrison took it up. Interesting. Could you write a view of history that would please both sides? So another example would be that North Korea and South Korea disagree on the Korean War. They have a different interpretation of history. For example, for the most part, North Korea, or the DPRK, teaches its citizens that it won the war and that the Americans or the United Nations forces were forced to surrender in the armistice of 1953. Obviously, South Korea and the international community have a very different interpretation of when the war started uh, and when the war ended. So what they're asking for here is we want to be able to write a version of history without any subjectivity and which must be agreed to by all parts, by the, you know, the for and the against, by both sides in a war. Is such a thing possible? If it were science, obviously, it would be. <clears throat> Even Sir George Clark, critical as he was of Acton's attitude, himself contrasted the hard core of facts in history with the surrounding pulp of disputable interpretation, forgetting perhaps that the pulpy part of the fruit is more rewarding than the hard core. First get your facts straight, then plunge at your peril into the shifting sands of interpretation. That is the ultimate wisdom of the empirical common sense school of history. It recalls the favorite dictum of the great liberal journalist, journalist C.P. Scott, facts are sacred, opinion is free. The pulpy part of the fruit is more rewarding than the hard core. You often won't convince anybody with data and statistics. You sometimes need rhetoric, words and arguments to convince people uh, what is something. There's a lot of truth in that. Now, this clearly will not do. I shall not embark on a philosophical discussion of the nature of our knowledge of the past. Let us assume, for the present purposes, that the fact that Caesar crossed the Rubicon <clears throat> and the fact that there is a table in the middle of the room are facts of the same or of a comparable order, that both these facts enter our consciousness in the same or in a comparable manner, and that both have the same objective character in relation to the person who knows them. But... Even on this bold and not very plausible assumption, our argument at once runs into the difficulty that not all facts about the past are historical facts or are treated as such by the historian. What is the criterion which distinguishes the facts of history from other facts about the past? So the question again was, what is history? So what distinguishes history from the past? Because we know what the past is, but not everything in the past is history. So what makes something enter the story of history? If you consider history a narrative, 
And if you consider history something that is built and combined by people as they go along, uh, Chesterton uh, called sort of education the passing on of the soul of the culture. What makes things become history rather than simply the past? It's an interesting question that uh, Carr raises. So he says, what is it? Let's just write this up here again very quickly. So you're looking at what is the difference between history and the past, right? Yoksa and guago. What's the difference between these two things? What is a historical fact? This is a crucial question into which we must look a little more closely. According to the common sense view, there are certain basic facts which are the same for all historians and which form, so to speak, the backbone of history. The fact, for example, that the Battle of Hastings was fought in 1066. But this view calls for two observations. In the first place, it is not with facts like these that the historian is primarily concerned. It is no doubt important to know that the great battle was fought in 1066 and not in 1065 or 1067, and that it was fought at Hastings and not at Eastbourne or Brighton. The historian must not get these things wrong. But when points of this kind are raised, I'm reminded of Hausmann's remark that accuracy is a duty, not a virtue. To praise historian for his accuracy is like praising an architect for using well-seasoned timber or properly mixed concrete in his building. It is a necessary condition of his work, but not his essential function. It is precisely for matters of this kind that the historian is entitled to rely on what have been called the auxiliary sciences of history, archaeology, epigraphy, numismatics, chronology, and so on forth. The historian is not required to have the special skills which enable the expert to determine the origin and period of a fragment of pottery or marble, to decipher an obscure inscription, or to make the elaborate astronomical calculations necessary to establish a precise date. These so-called basic facts, which are the same for all historians, commonly belong to the category of the raw materials of the historian rather than of the history itself. So, just to be clear here and work out where we are, th to get facts correct is necessary, but it's not a virtue. It is not the essential function. So this is very uh, reminiscent to me, at least, of the idea of telos, which is the Aristotelian concept of you know uh, whether something is good or bad according to whether it achieves its telos, which is its end, its goal, or its purpose. Uh, so to give an example, if you have a pen, is this a good pen? Well, what is the goal of a pen? The goal of a pen is to write. So if the pen writes, then it's a good pen. If the pen doesn't write, it's a bad pen. Even if the pen has gold and uh, a water dispenser and all of these things, the telos, the essential function of a pen is to write. So you judge it according to that essential function and nothing else. So, what is the essential function of history? What is the essential function? What is the goal of history? You could even be a bit broader than that if you want. It's very philosophical, though, and say, what is the uh, essential function of man, woman, human beings? Do we have a telos? Do we have an end goal or a purpose? Here, Carr says, the, the, the facts and the data, you know, to remember certain dates, to remember uh, 1945, 1948, 1950, 1953, all these dates that echo through for ha perhaps Korean history, they're not the historian's responsibility. They are uh, produced by different sciences to get these dates and to mark them and to get them correct. And they're available to all historians. He continues, the second observation is that the necessity to establish these basic facts rests not on any quality in the facts themselves, but on an a priori decision of the historian. In spite of C.P. Scott's motto, every journalist knows today that the most effective way to influence opinion is by the selection and arrangement of the appropriate facts. It used to be said that facts speak for themselves. This is, of course, untrue. 
The facts speak only when the historian calls on them. It is he who decides to which facts to give the floor and in what order or context. It was, I think, one of Pirandello's characters who said that a fact is like a sack. It won't stand up until you've put something in it. Uh, Luigi Pirandello, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1936, a dramatist from Italy, short stories. Um, but facts are not the important thing. It's selecting the facts. It's arranging the facts. Uh, and I like this idea of Pirandello's that a fact doesn't do anything until you put something around it, until you do something with it. So an empty sack is nothing. You put something in it and it has a function. So um, facts by themselves are nothing. They need to be interpreted. They need to be selected, chosen, and then they need to be presented. And then they need to be interpreted by other people people as well so then you get into that like you know Saussure would talk about the sign and the symbol the signified uh, these things can mean different things to different people and it's what we embed into them the only reason why we are interested to know that the battle was fought at Hastings in 1066 is that historians regard it as a major historical event it is the historian who has decided for his own reasons that Caesar's crossing of that petty stream, the Rubicon, is a fact of history, whereas the crossing of the Rubicon by millions of other people before or since interests nobody at all. The fact that you arrived in this building half an hour ago on foot or on a bicycle or in a car is just as much a fact about the past as the fact that Caesar crossed the Rubicon, but it will probably be ignored by historians. So everything happened in the past, but not everything is history. So the difference between past and history is that historians choose some things, according to Carlos, is by the way, historians choose some things to become history. History is selected. It's not just there all the time, because we don't record every person that... Um, crossed a stream, the idea of Caesar and the Rubicon. But when certain influential actions happen, we write them down, we enter them into history, we remember them, we give them meaning and we pass them on right into, into the broader culture. So the difference between the past and history, according to Carr here, is selection. We select which ones. Once we've select them, then we also choose how to present them. We say why we have selected certain facts press my button here shift and e. All right <clears throat> but it will probably oh, sorry yeah professor talcott parsons once called science a selective system of cognitive orientations to re a selective system of cognitive orientations to reality it might perhaps have been put more simply but history is, among other things, that the historian is necessarily selective. The belief in a hard core of historical facts existing objectively and independently of the interpretation of the historian is a preposterous fallacy, but one which it is very hard to eradicate. Why is that? Why would Carr say that, first of all, that... You know, there is not history just sitting out there independent of us. History isn't just a thing that exists in the world. History is something that is created by us. But even though we know this is true, why do we have this idea that history is objective? Why is that hard to eradicate? That's what he's questioning here. Um, just with history, there's a, a couple of uh, quotes in history. Obviously, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, had a, a famous um, comment, whether it's apocryphal or re he really said it. He said, history is a set of lies agreed upon. History is a set of lies agreed upon. So history is just, it, it's not true, but as long as we all agree upon it, as long as we agree upon these lies, then it will become history. So there's that collective idea, okay, that if one person believes it, it doesn't become history. It requires collective, yeah, requires collective understanding. 
Uh, another one that I've always liked is a Russian proverb that says the past is unpredictable. If you hear that out of this context, it doesn't make sense because how can the past be unpredictable? The future is unpredictable. How can the past be unpredictable? But it is. And you can see now why that might work in Carr's uh, exploration of history, because history can change. And certainly in the Soviet Union, you know, people would be erased from history. Bad guys would become good guys. Good guys would become bad guys. You see that, uh, you know, in many countries around the world, you see that in North Korea, how birthplaces are changed and names and, and things like this. So the past is unpredictable. So how does how does the past become history? So we said they're different. We said that they're selected. Let's take a look what uh, Carr continues with, with the past and history and the facts. These are words, codes that you need to know to understand. Right, Let us take a look at the process by which a mere fact about the past is transformed into a fact of history. At Stalebridge Wakes in 1850, a vendor of gingerbread as the result of some petty dispute was deliberately kicked to death by an angry mob. Is this a fact of history? A year ago I should unhesitatingly have said no. It was recorded by an eyewitness in some little known memoirs but I'd never seen it judged worthy of mention by any historian. A year ago, Dr. Kitson Clark cited it in his Ford lectures in Oxford. Does this make it a historical? This makes me laugh because yes, on this page, it's changed every word fact into fart. I'll do my best to uh, read it correctly. It's hilarious though, the first time I saw it. Does this make it into a historical fact? Not, I think, yet. Its present status, I suggest, is that it has been proposed for membership of the Select Club of Historical Facts. It now awaits a seconder and a sponsors, is the collective idea. It may be that in the course of the next few years, we shall see this fact appearing first in footnotes, then in the text of articles and books about 19th century England. And in 20 or 30 years' time, it may be a well-established historical fact. Alternatively, Nobody may take it up, in which case it will relapse into the limbo of unhistorical facts about the past from which Dr. Kitson Clark has gallantly attempted to rescue it. What will decide which of these two things happen? It will depend, I think, on whether the thesis or interpretation in support of which Dr. Kitson Clark cited this incident is accepted by other historians as valid and significant. Its status as an historical fact will turn on a question of interpretation. This element of interpretation enters into every fact of history. This collective idea, a seconder and a sponsors, is really important here as you get interpretation. So something happens in the past, okay? Something happens in the past, let's call that X. So at the moment, it's, um, it's still in the past, according to Carr. But then one historian comes on along and he decides that this event of X is worthy to write about in one of his books. Is this now history? Well, Carr says no, because it's a proposed membership. It's proposed history. So it's gone from the past to proposed. So I'm using P again, but hopefully you can follow to proposed history. So it's coming to this stage where it will be decided yes or no. It's been dug up and now it's there. And what will turn it into history or not? It can go two ways. It can go back to the past or it can become history according to whether many other historians agree with it or not. If many other historians agree with that view, the past becomes history. If other people do not agree with that, then it just goes back into the past. It becomes relegated and forgotten. So how does a fact become history? Carl points out there's a three-stage thing here that I hope makes sense to you. He continues, <clears throat> May I be allowed a personal reminiscence? When I studied ancient history in this university many years ago, I had as a special subject Greece, in the period of the Persian Wars. I collected 15 or 20 volumes on my shelves and took it for granted that there 
recorded in these volumes I had all the facts relating to my subject. Let us assume, it was very nearly true, that these volumes contained all the facts about it that were then known or could be known. It never occurred to me to inquire by what accident or process of attrition that minute selection of facts out of all the myriad facts that must once have been known to somebody had survived to become the facts of history. I suspect that even today one of the fascinations of ancient and medieval history is that it gives us the illusion of having all the facts at our disposable with disposal within a manageable compass. The nagging distinction between the facts of history and other facts about the past vanishes because the few known facts are all facts of history. As Berry, who had worked in both periods, said, the records of ancient and medieval history are starred with lacunae. History has been called an enormous jigsaw with lots of missing parts. But the main trouble does not consist in the lacunae. Our picture of Greece in the 5th century BC is defective not primarily because so many of the bits have been accidentally lost, but because it is, by and large, the picture formed by a tiny group of people in the city of Athens. We know a lot about what 5th century Greece looked like to an Athenian citizen, but hardly anything about what it looked like to a Spartan, a Corinthian, or a Theban, not to mention a Persian, or a slave, or other non-citizen resident in Athens. Our picture has been pre-selected and predetermined for us, not so much by accident as by people who are consciously or unconsciously imbued with a particular view and through the facts which supported that view worth preserving. So he gives the analogy here of a puzzle yeah, with jigsaw pieces. Right? I don't know if you know what a, a puzzle is. It's not a very good puzzle, but you get the point. He's saying when we look at the past, when we look at you know medieval period, World War One. Uh, the Peloponnesian Wars, whatever it might be, the, we're not missing pieces. It's not the fact that we don't have enough information. We have a complete view of the past here. But this complete view with no pieces missing is the view of one type of person in that society. It's not the complete view. It's not the complete puzzle which would be something perhaps like this, with the different people in the society all having their views, which then make up the broader picture of what that state is. Okay, that makes sense. So in a society, uh, if you take Korea today, modern Korea 2020, what is modern Korea 2020? Well, the conservatives will have a different view of it than the progressives. The men might have a different view of it than the women. The old might have a different view of it than the young. And the, the Koreans might have a different view to the foreigners or to the outside observers. So what is the real Korea? Well, essentially, the real Korea is all of those things put together, right? You have to get them all together and account for them and not try to omit any for any political or ideological reasons. That is the real Korea, if you think about it in the present. Yeah? You try to accept everybody's view. The same with history. But because history is selected and passed down and it's interpreted by people, a lot of the things get missing and then we're just left with one view. It's not wrong, but it's incomplete. There's a wonderful saying like that. It's not that generalizations are wrong, it's that they're incomplete. They don't show the complexity and they don't show the nuance. So that's something that we have to keep in mind when we look at history. We're looking at a, a, a selected view. It might not be wrong, but it might be incomplete. Something to put there. Um, you, you see elements in that, I think, with uh, with Shin Che Ho. OK, uh, I should write in English because we have international students. Um, <laughs> it's really bad writing. Shin Cheho, uh, he introduced the idea sort of in the late 1800s in Korean history of the Minjok. And the Minjok is the people as family. So you have the Min, you know, the Guk Min, the Im Min, uh, the Min Jung. But the Minjok, because uh, when Shin Cheho was looking at uh, Korean history, he noticed it was just the story of the kings. You know, one king would live, 
king would die the next king would come along he would be a good king next king was a bad king next king put his son in a box the world was turning and everybody was living their lives but history uh, you know certain parts of it was just the history of the kings the history of the court or the state the history of the yang bands and it wasn't the history of the people that lived so xing che ho in doing that and he had various political and ideological reasons for it himself however but one of those things was to tell the story of the people you know xing che ho was adding one of the pieces of the puzzle to the korean thing there and you might argue that it wasn't actually there before there wasn't a national consciousness before uh, xing che ho put this piece of the puzzle in and added to it so the people actually in society have to be autonomous subjects to put their story in because if they don't not many people are going to put it in for them you know the people have to be um historically subjective right they have to be subjective and interpret their story into it otherwise it will get left out so if you take a totalitarian state like nazi germany like perhaps the dprk north korea the people or well, the citizens there aren't very subjective they're not telling their sides of the story there's one state totalitarian authoritarian view and the other people do not rise up and put in theirs and so the picture remains controlled so uh, i hope we've made some progress on, on on this page here excuse me i've been talking a lot today and we continue in the same way when i read in a history of the middle ages that the people of the middle ages were deeply concerned with religion i wonder how we know this and whether it is true what we know is the facts of medieval history have almost all been selected for us by generations of chroniclers who were professionally occupied in the theory and practice of religion and who therefore thought it supremely important and recorded everything related to it and not much else the picture of the russian peasant as devoutly religious was destroyed by the revolution of 1917 the picture of medieval man as devoutly religious whether true or not is indestructible because nearly all the known facts about him were pre-selected for us by people who believed it and wanted others to believe it and a mass of other facts in which we might possibly have found evidence to the contrary have been lost beyond recall the dead hand of vanished generations of historians scribes and chroniclers has determined beyond the possibility of appeal the pattern of the past fabulous line right so you would argue are you meant to write like this you know this is not scientific writing but it's fabulous there's a wonderful literary quality of it you know and you'd be inclined to go and use that line the dead hand yourself just one more time because i think it's so important the dead hand of vanished generations of historians scribes and chroniclers has determined beyond the possibility of appeal the pattern of the past it's already been agreed upon by these people writing it down right and it, it, it's done you know it's very hard to change what we know about certain things about history because it, it's been set you know there is movements to go and and revisit these things i will say that when we're looking for things he's saying here that when people look for religion in the middle ages you know that's all they see everything was religious you do the same when you're writing a paper if you're writing a paper about you know tada or something that the car sharing service you go through the internet and you find everything to tada but you ignore everything else okay if you're writing something about international relations between uh india and the soviet union during the cold war you read all these books but you only take out the bits that you want right we select for what we think is important to our particular goals let's continue the history we read writes professor baraclough himself trained as a medievalist though based on facts is strictly speaking not factual at all but a series of accepted judgments it's like napoleon but let us turn to the different but equally grave plight of the modern historian the ancient or medieval historian may be grateful for the vast winnowing process which over the years has put at his disposable 
disposal and manageable corpus of historical facts. As Lytton Strachey said in his mischievous way, ignorance is the first requisite of the historian, ignorance which simplifies and clarifies, which selects and omits. When I am tempted, as I sometimes am, to envy the extreme competence of colleagues engaged in writing ancient or medieval history, I find consolation in the reflection that they are so competent mainly because they are so ignorant of their subject. The modern historian enjoys none of the advantages of this built-in ignorance. He must cultivate this necessary ignorance for himself, the more so the nearer he comes to his own times. He has the dual task of discovering the few significant facts and turning them into facts of history, and of discarding the many insignificant facts as unhistorical. But this is the very converse of the 19th century heresy that history consists of the compilation of a maximum number of irrefutable and objective facts. The idea is that, you know, when you're looking in history, uh, th this 19th century idea, this idealist, uh, objective, positivist, empiricist idea where you can turn it into a science, if you imagine like in a computer game, they will tell you there's 25 coins to collect on this level, right? There's 25 and you've got zero. So you go out and get them. And once you've got them, you have the maximum number of the irrefutable and objective facts. But Carr is saying that's not what it's like. There's not a set number of facts that make history. You know, the number of facts that make history is undecided. And it's determined by what the person might interpret as history. That's what's going on there. Anyone who succumbs to this heresy will either have to give up history as a bad job or to take to stamp collecting or some other form of antiquarianism or end in a madhouse. It is this heresy which during the past hundred years has had such devastating effects on the modern historian, producing in Germany, in Great Britain and in the United States a vast and growing mass of dry as dust factual histories, of minutely specialised monographs of would-be historians knowing more and more about less and less sunk without trace in an oceans of facts. It was, I suspect, this heresy, rather than the alleged conflict between liberal and Catholic loyalties, which frustrated Acton as a historian. In an early essay he said of his teacher Dollinger, he would not write with imperfect materials, and to him, the materials were always imperfect. Acton was surely here pronouncing an anticipatory verdict on himself, on that strange phenomenon of a historian whom many would regard as the most distinguished occupant the Regius Chair of Modern History in this university has ever had, but who wrote no history. And Acton wrote his own epitaph in the introductory note to the first volume of the Cambridge Modern History, published just after his death, when he lamented that the requirements pressing on the historian threatened to turn him from a man of letters into the compiler of an encyclopedia. Something had gone wrong. What had gone wrong was the belief in this untiring and unending accumulation of hard facts as the foundation of history. The beliefs that facts speak for themselves and that we cannot have too many facts. A belief that at the time so unquestioning that few historians then thought it necessary and some still think it unnecessary today to ask themselves the question, what is history? You should have a little bit of an idea now what he's talking about when he says, what is history? At the start of this, when you had the question, what is history? It might have been very confusing to you. Yeah, of course, you know what history is, but now you know what Carr is getting to with history. You know, we can look at other people soon. Colin would, would, be, would be one of them. But according to Carr, history is, is not just the collection of facts. You know, he, he, he criticizes and laments this idea that people uh, just look for more facts and facts and facts. And, you know, it turns dry as dust. It's like reading a Wikipedia page. Nobody reads a Wikipedia page for fun. Why? Because it's just got facts for the most part. Wikipedia is a bad example, but, you know, you don't read an encyclopedia generally for fun. You might read a history book for fun because some historians write very well and they tell a story and they make it come alive. You know, they give it characters and and you interpret it and you and you believe it more. And so that is the job of history. And that's what history 
Kyrie saying not has always been because there have been moments when history in different countries turns towards being of letters and being of facts whether it should be this way or that way but it can't just be of facts Kari saying because it involves people and people always interpret things and choose things and choose what to write about so uh, that's where we are we'll just read one more paragraph and I think we're going to skip this example because it's a long example but we don't need to read it the 19th century fetishism of facts was completed and justified by a fetishism of documents. The documents were the Ark of the Covenant in the Temple of Facts. The reverent historian approached them with bowed head and spoke of them in awed tones. If you find it in the documents, it is so. But what, when we get down to it, do these documents, the decrees, the treaties, the rent rolls, the blue books, the official correspondence, the private letters and diaries, tell us? No document can tell us more than what the author of the document thought, what he thought had happened, what he thought ought to happen or would happen, or perhaps only what he want others to think he thought, or even only what he himself thought he thought. None of this means anything until the historian has got to work on it and deciphered it. The facts, whether found in documents or not, have still to be processed by the historian before he can make any use of them. The use he makes of them is, if I may put it that way, the processing process. So you get this idea that, you know, when you, you find something in a book and that's a fact, I'm going to put that in my article, I'm going to put that in my research paper. You're not so much finding a fact, you're finding, according to Carr, what someone has written down, what someone thought happened or what someone wanted to happen what someone wanted other people to think he thought. So then we get into this kind of, uh, this concept of the looking glass self. The car seems to be slightly bringing in here. Uh, maybe it's not quite applicable, but the looking glass self by uh, Cooley, who said, I am not, three parts. I am not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. I am what you think. <laughs> Your identity. I need to go and double check that. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. It's this idea that um, identities are created in concert, in harmony with other people. You know, you, you can have your own idea of what you think something is and this is what you think it is and believe it to be true but it only becomes true when it's collective when other people agree on it so there's a sociological idea here that needs to come in right there's a sociological a collective idea that needs to be agreed upon so when you have you know this the historian and his facts which car be begins with in the the singular the historian and his facts cannot produce history. The story, the historian selects facts, which then have to be agreed upon by other historians to change from facts of the past into facts of history. So something that requires a collective understanding there. And you will notice that this is not written uh, like a science, right? So uh, the language here. The documents were the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant in the Temple of Facts. The reverent historian approached them with bowed head and spoke of them in awed tones. If you find it in the documents, it is so. It's literature, but it makes the point. And it makes the point very well because a lot of the time, and here's a, here's a funny thing, that fiction will tell us more than fact. We sometimes learn more from fiction. It's why George Orwell would write allegories, you know, the animal farm using using pigs and horses. But it told us so much about human nature. It gave us so much real, true information. The same thing with Hamlet. Hamlet's not true, but yet it tells you so much. It tells you so much, gives you so much uh, knowledge and experience and understanding. In the same way, you could read somebody's diary, which would actually be true, and it would tell you nothing. There is this paradox in there in that, you know, just relying on facts doesn't always tell you what you need to know. 
sometimes fiction can tell you a greater truth. You know, one fiction can tell you a greater truth than a hundred facts. And that's not to advocate for fake news or lying, anything like that. It's just the way the human mind interprets information, I believe. You know, we, we're designed to learn from stories sometimes. Um, I'm just going to skip a little bit here. You can read that if you want. He's talking about people that uh, collect documents and they find them and, you know, but that's just one person's documents. It's not the other people's documents. And um, it's the idea of, how would I describe it? The Russian dolls, for example. It starts this big and, you know, you've got all the dolls in between, right? So there's one big pile of documents and one historian gets what he wants and he writes it down. And then the next historians come along and the, the amount of facts gets smaller and then it's translated into another language. But, you know, they don't really need these bits. So they chop that out. And eventually this whole big you know, thing gets whittled away until it's very small. And so then really, what is the truth in all that? Because you're omitting and editing things all the time. You might think of religious texts such as the Bible as, you know, quite an interesting idea of that. <clears throat> uh, let us continue from here. So this is uh, bottom of page 20. During the past 50 years, a good deal of serious work has been done on the question, what is history? It was from Germany, the country which has to do so much to upset the comfortable reign of 19th century liberalism that the first challenge came in the 1880s and 1890s to the doctrine of the primacy and autonomy of facts in history. The philosophers who made the challenge are now little more than names. Dilthey is the only one of them who has re recently received some belated recognition in Great Britain. Before the turn of the century, prosperity and confidence were still too great in this country for any attention to be paid to heretics who attacked the cult of facts. But early in the new century, the torch passed to Italy, where Croquet began to propound a philosophy of history which obviously owed much to the German masters. All history is contemporary history, declared Croquet, meaning that history consists essentially in seeing the past through the eyes of the present and in the light of its problems, and the main work of the historian is not to record, but to evaluate. For if he does not evaluate, how can he know what is worth recording? In 1910, the American historian Carl Becker argued in deliberately provocative language that the facts of history do not exist for any historian till he creates them. These challenges were for the moment little noticed. It was only after 1920 that Croquet began to have a considerable vogue in France and Great Britain. This was not perhaps because Croquet was a subtler thinker or a better stylist than his German predecessors, but because after the First World War, the facts seemed to smile on us less propitiously than in the years before 1914, and we were therefore more accessible to a philosophy which sought to diminish their prestige. Croquet was an important influence on the Oxford philosopher and historian Collinwood, the only British thinker in the present century who has made a serious contribution to the philosophy of history. He did not live to write the systematic treaty he had planned, but his published and unpublished papers on the subject were collected after his death in a volume entitled The Idea of History, which appeared in 1945. We come now to uh, a little bit the idea of the present, okay? And uh, Carr does this epistemological journey in that, you know, he traces where this interpretation of history comes from he doesn't say boom it came here but he traces where you know it would start in certain places and the torch would be passed to this person and, and then this person would pick it up and then a few decades later it would arrive in this country so he sees the journey or he sees the development of a particular idea over time you know that's something later that maybe Michel Foucault would do or even Nietzsche, where they would do this genealogy, okay? They would do this uh, epistemological journey of ideas. And that's what Carr has a little bit in his approach here. And one of the ideas he's looking here is where he picks up this idea is all history is contemporary history. History consists essentially in seeing the past through the eyes of the present and in the light of its problems, right? So there's a two part. Right. History is two parts, seeing the past through the present and in awareness of present 
can't write quickly enough, all right? Uh, present problems. So that's what history is. History is looking at the past through the present and knowing about present problems. So as I gave the example before, if one of the problems in society that interests somebody might be racial discrimination, they will look at the past through the lens of the present and see, look for problems of racial discrimination in the past because that's what they're experiencing in the present. If it might be gender oppression, it might be economic problems, or they might be living in the present and saying, you know, the world is pretty good, we've got it going on. You take Steven Pinker's ideas, for example, on Enlightenment Now, where the world is safer, more productive, more literate, healthier than it's ever been. And so you, you know, that's not a problem, that's, that's a benefit, but that's how you see, or how Steven Pinker sees the present. And so he goes back and he looks through the past, from the present, with that view and he finds all of those facts that suit his hypothesis or that suit his ideology that suit his view on the present world that's uh one thing that history is it tells us about the present and it tells us about how that person sees the world in the present um let's have a look at collingwood here uh, the views of collingwood can be summarized as follows the philosophy, is, the philosophy of history is concerned neither with the past by itself, nor with the historian's thought about it by itself, but with the two things in their mutual relations. Right? That's really important there. This dictum reflects the two current meanings of the word history. The inquiry conducted by the historian and the series of past events into which he acquires. The past which a historian studies is not a dead past but a past in which some sense is still living in the present. But a past act is dead, i.e. meaningless to the historian, unless he can understand the thought that lay behind it. Hence, all history is the history of thought, and history is the reenactment in the historian's mind of the thought whose history he is studying. The reconstitution of the past in the historian's mind is dependent on empirical evidence, but it is not in itself an empirical process and cannot consist in mere recital of facts, on the contrary, the process of reconstitution governs the selection and interpretation of the facts. This, indeed, is what makes them historical facts. History, says Professor Oakeshott, who on this point stands near to Collingwood, is the historian's experience. It is made by nobody save the historian to write history is the only way of making it. History is made by nobody but the historian to write history is the only way of making it. Um, just mark this here before I continue. Uh, we'll skip these little bits. Um, what I want to point out here with Collingwood, uh, Collingwood believed in this uh, reimagination re of history, right? This historical reimagination. History is the history of thought. So because somebody wrote it down, because somebody uh, was motivated to write something down and record it, there must have been a reason for them doing that. So when you approach these documents, these historical facts, what Collingwood said is you need to approach the reasons why they were writing them down. You needed to get into their thought processes to really understand that history. So it's kind of like a psychological approach in that you needed to uh, focus on the reasonings, the motivations for people writing down history, and that would give you a better understanding of what was in the page. You see some perhaps examples in, in theatre where you have Stanislavskian actors rather than Brechtian actors. The Stanislavskian actors, they like to get into the mindset of the people, and if they're trying to uh, portray a scene or they're acting and they have to be sad in that scene, They'll imagine a sad scene in their mind or they'll revisit something from their past, you know, they'll get into that psychological mindset. That's what Collingwood was suggesting with history um, to do, this uh, historical reimagination, reenactment. It's a nice line here. The past which a historian studies is not a dead past, but a past which in some sense is still living in the present. makes a mess of the idea of time doesn't it especially of linear time you know from 
from start to finish it, it you know messes it all up because the past influences the future and the future influences the past there's a wonderful uh, Netflix drama called Dark. It's a German, uh, it's a German drama, uh, but it very much goes on that idea. And if you've read Car or if you have ideas of this, it, it makes even more kind of sense. It doesn't seem as science fiction, but you understand that academically it, it's quite interesting. So if you're ever bored, have a look for Dark on Netflix. A uh, fantastic piece of drama. I highly recommend. Uh, I've not seen season two, though, so no spoilers if you have. Let's continue here. So I, I've skipped a little bit because I want to come back to... Um, uh, I want to come back to Collingwood a bit. But in order to appreciate it at its full value, you have to understand what the historian is doing. For if, as Collingwood says, the historian must reenact in thought what has gone on in the mind of his dramatis personae, so the reader in his turn must reenact what goes on in the mind of the historian. Study the historian before you begin to study the facts. This is, after all, not very abstruse. It is what is already done by the intelligent undergraduate, who, when recommended to read a work by that great scholar Jones of St. Jude's, goes round to a friend at St. Jude's to ask what sort of chap Jones is and what bees he has in his bonnet. When you read a work of history, always listen out for the buzzing. If you can detect none, either you are tone deaf or your historian is a dull dog. The facts are really not at all like fish on the fishmonger's slab. They are like fish swimming about in a vast and sometimes inaccessible ocean. And what the historian catches will depend, partly on chance, but mainly on what part of the ocean he chooses to fish in and what tackle he chooses to use. These two factors being, of course, determined by the kind of fish he wants to catch. By and large, the historian will get the kind of facts he wants. History means interpretation. Indeed, if standing Sir George Clarke on his head, I were to call history a hardcore of interpretation surrounded by a pulp of disputable facts, my statement would no doubt be one-sided and misleading, but no more so, I venture, to think than the original dictum. The second point is the more familiar, one of the historian's need of imaginative understanding for the minds of the people with whom he is dealing, for the thought behind their acts. I say imaginative understanding, not sympathy, lest sympathy should be supposed to imply agreement. The 19th century was weak in medieval history because it was too much repelled by the superstitious beliefs of the Middle Ages and by the Barbarites, which they inspired, to have any imaginative understanding of medieval people. Or take Burkhardt's censorious remark about the Thirty Years' War. It is scandalous for a creed, no matter whether it is Catholic or Protestant, to place its salvation above the integrity of the nation. It was extremely difficult for a 19th century liberal historian, brought up to believe that it is right and praiseworthy to kill in defence of one country, but wicked and wrong-headed to kill in defence of one's religion, to enter into the state of mind who those who fought the Thirty Years' War. This difficulty is particularly acute in the field in which I am now working. Much of what has been written in English-speaking countries in the last ten years about the Soviet Union, and in the Soviet Union about the English-speaking countries, has been vitiated by this inability to achieve even the most elementary measure of imaginative understanding of what goes on in the mind of the other party, so that the words and actions of the other are always made to appear malign, senseless or hypocritical. History cannot be written unless the historian can achieve some kind of contact with the mind of those about whom he is writing. Okay, uh, fabulous line that's always stuck with me. When you read a work of history, always listen out for the buzzing. The buzzing is the personal interpretation. And if you can detect none, either you're not paying close enough attention or the history is boring. OK, so there, there must always be something between the lines of good history. It's there to be found and interpreted. Now, we, we come into this idea of imaginative understanding in that you have to put yourself, when you study history, into the minds of the people that were in the history because your values in the present will be different from the people that you study you will have different values okay and so you can't 
put into the past or impose on the past what Kari is saying at least uh, your values so when religious wars were at their peak uh, people would choose their religion as the ultimate creed that they would live and die for and that was just natural at that time however when the wars of nationalism were at their peak then you couldn't imagine that people would put religion ahead it would only be national things you know so people's values and ideas always change and to study history you don't have to accept what the other people think at that time but you have to try to understand you have to try to imagine and put yourself there to understand how they're thinking rather than just judge them from your modern perspective which is very easy to do but it doesn't get anywhere and it also ignores the fact that um uh, let's say what uh, Foucault would call an episteme that each age and generation has certain things that are valued okay so right now we live in a time where human rights and democracy uh, equality there are certain things that are very natural to us and we can't imagine life without them but there was a time before this when there were different things that were important and those people in that time couldn't imagine anything different and there will come a time after us most probably unless Fukuyama's end of history is right there will come a time after us there will be another episteme where different words values codes signs will become the things that people use and so you need to change times just to give you one music example of this sometimes people might listen to um you know little richard uh 19 1950s 1960s you know piano rock and roll player and you know they, they say it sounds boring or it doesn't sound heavy when i hear it it sounds so heavy to me it hasn't got like down tuned guitars and five you know stack watt marshall amplifiers and things like that it's not going but considering what other music was being made at the time putting it into his context of what he was doing then you understand wow that is really quite heavy if you have imaginative understanding i wasn't listening to music in the 60s I wasn't born I wasn't an idea yet I wasn't even in the past so that I think is very important also be important when you're studying because of your ideological reasons yeah whether it might be uh, social class economic class race gender those kind of things you need to try to use imaginative understanding or at least or at least Carr uh, and Collingwood would, would say you do specifically Collingwood yeah, that's their idea as long as you understand it aristotle had the um aristotle's quote was it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain an idea without accepting it right so you have to be able to put thoughts into your mind you don't have sympathy as as i say here you don't agree with it but you can play with it you can entertain stuff in your mind and you know do thought experiments that's that's real education or imagination let's uh let's continue a little bit we're, we're nearly getting towards the end i think the third point is that we can view the past and achieve our understanding of the past only through the eyes of the present the historian is of his own age and is bound to it by the conditions of human existence the very words which he uses, words like democracy, empire, war, revolution, have current connotations from which he cannot divorce them. Ancient historians have taken to using words like polis and plebs in the original, just in order to show that they have not fallen into this trap. This does not help them. They too live in the present and cannot cheat themselves into the past by using unfamiliar or obsolete words any more than they would become better Greek or Roman historians if they delivered their lectures in a shamless or a toga. The names by which successive French historians have described the Parisian crowds which played so prominent a role in the French Revolution, les Saint-Coulettes, les Peuples, les Canilles, les Bras Nus, are all for those who know the rules of the game, manifestos of a political affiliation and of a particular interpretation. Yet the historian is obliged to choose. The use of language forbids him to be neutral, nor is it a matter of words alone. Over the past hundred years, the changed balance of power in Europe has reversed the attitudes of British historians to Frederick the Great. Let me just stop here, but um, this one I think is uh, when they're talking about what you call people right, in the French Revolution, what you call people shows that you're not neutral. 
right? So if you call people Inmin, if you call people Gugmin, all right? It depends what you call people shows your political affiliation. If you call people Minjok, if you call people Minjung, they all have different meanings and the words that you use will bring them. So the the use of language, we're obliged to choose. The use of language is not neutral, okay? And so you have to think about the words that people use when they describe things because it screams, it should scream to you what they're saying, especially, you know, you should be able to understand. And also you want to think about this, the words that you use and whether you use these words uh, online, on Twitter, in your writing, if you write articles, things like that, even if you write a personal diary that no one else sees, the words that you use are very important, okay, and they, they will start manifesting in in your wider life. So that's something that is, is worth, I believe, looking out for. Uh, let's jump forward a bit. Um, <clears throat> here is where I want to start, sorry. Professor Trevor Roper tells us that the historian ought to love the past. This is a dubious injunction. To love the past may easily be an expression of the nostalgic romanticism of old men and old societies, a symptom of loss of faith and interest in the present or future. Latin and Malia, okay, boomer. Cliché for cliché, I should prefer the one about freeing oneself from the dead hand of the past. The function of the historian is neither to love the past nor to emancipate himself from the past, but to master and understand it as the key to the understanding of the present. We started this lecture with that quote on the screen. Maybe now that gives you a better context in which to understand what's going on here. Right? So the historian's function, right? the function of the historian. I introduced this concept of the telos. What is the goal? What is the aim? You can see here that maybe Carr is introducing that. So this might be Carr's particular view. You need to understand it and then analyze whether you agree or disagree with it. If, however, there are some of these insights of what I may call the Collingwood view of history, it is time to consider some of the dangers. The emphasis on the role of this story and in the making of history tends, if pressed to its logical conclusion, to rule out any objective history at all. History is what the historian makes. Collingwood seems indeed at one moment in an unpublished note quoted by his editor to have reached this conclusion. St. Augustine looked at history from the point of view of the early Christian, Tillemont from the view of a 17th century Frenchman, Gibbon from that of an 18th century Englishman, Mommsen from that of a 19th century German. There is no point in asking which was the right point of view. Each was the only one possible for the man who adopted it. That's Collingwood. Carr. This amounts to total scepticism. Like Freud's remark that history is a child's box of letters which we can spell any word we please. Collingwood, in his reaction against scissors and paste history, against the view of history as a mere compilation of facts, comes perilously near to a treating history as something spun out of the human brain and leads back to the conclusion referred to by Sir George Clark in the passage which I quoted earlier that there is no objective historical truth. In place of the theory that history has no meaning, we are offered here the theory of an infinity of meanings, none any more right than any other, which comes to much the same thing. The second theory is surely as untenable as the first. It does not follow that, so, you know, Carr's disagreeing with these criticisms. It does not follow that because a mountain appears to take on different shapes from different angles of vision. It is objectively even no shape at all or an infinity of shapes. It does not follow that because interpretation plays a necessary part and establishing the facts of history. And because no in existing interpretation is wholly objective, one interpretation is as good as another. The facts of history are in principle not amenable to inje objective interpretation. I shall have to consider at a later stage what is exactly is meant by objectivity in history. So, He's disagreeing with the idea that everyone's view counts. If history is made and anyone can make it, then there is no objective history or there's nothing there. Carr's disagreeing with this. Um, you know, if you look at a mountain from different sides, it will take on 
different shapes and you'll see different things this is the blind men and the elephant okay if you know the blind men and the elephant if you don't have a look but there's five men oh, i'm definitely not going to draw an elephant well i'm going to try right ah. and he's got some big ears um looks like a dinosaur uh, there's five men all hanging oh, of course it, he needs to have a trunk right there's five blind men all holding on to a part of an elephant and one person is holding the trunk and he says oh, it's like a rope he's holding the leg he says it's like a tree he's holding the body he says it's like a box and so they but they're all sure that that this is what it is like however there is still an elephant there there is still something there they just have incomplete views if i could go back up it's gone now but when i showed you the idea of the puzzle yeah um and we had you know we had just one view of it but the other bits you might say or kari saying are still there it doesn't mean just everything it's all different that's kind of where you get into postmodernity, and you can see that this idea of subjective truth and this is my truth these things have been going around for a long time they're not new they're not original but perhaps they were interpreted or applied with a little bit more sophistication in the past and they were you know not so readily uh, jumped upon let's have a little bit more shall we and let's get rid of this but a still greater danger lurks in the Collingwood hypothesis. Excuse me. The Collingwood hypothesis that perhaps, you know, there is no possible view. We need to use reimagination. If the historian necessarily looks at this period of history through the eyes of his own time and studies the problems of the past as a key to those of the present, will he not fall into a purely pragmatic view of the facts and maintain that the criterion of a right interpretation is its suitability to some present purpose. On this hypothesis, the facts of history are nothing. Interpretation is everything. Nietzsche had already enunciated the principle. The falseness of an opinion is not for us any objection to it. The question is how far it is life furthering, life preserving, species preserving, perhaps species creating. The American pragmatists move less explicitly and less wholeheartedly along the same line. Knowledge is knowledge for some purpose. The valid validity of the knowledge depends on the validity of the purpose. But even when no such theory has been professed, the practice has often been no less disquieting. In my own field of study, I've seen too many examples of extravagant interpretation riding roughshod over facts, not to be impressed with the reality of this danger. It is not surprising that perusal of some of the more extreme products of Soviet and anti-Soviet schools of histori historiography should sometimes breed a certain nostalgia for that illusory 19th century haven of purely factual history. So sometimes you don't need facts, but you need what it achieves, right? So it's a very pragmatic idea. Um, it doesn't matter if something is false. It matters if it uh, serves your purpose. And that's a very dangerous way to uh, start getting into words. You know, it doesn't matter if what I wrote was true or false, but it matters if it continues my objective or my ideology or my thoughts that's very very dangerous and it's not history at all of course you know it's complete fiction and different groups have used that differently how then uh, <clears throat> how then in the middle of the 20th century are we to define the obligation of the historian to the facts I trust that I've spent a sufficient number of hours in recent years chasing and perusing documents and stuffing my historical narrative with properly footnoted facts to escape the imputation of treating facts and documents too cavalierly. The duty of the historian to respect his facts is not exhausted by the obligation to see that his facts are accurate. He must seek to bring into the picture all known or knowable facts relevant in one sense or another to the theme on which he is engaged and to the interpretation proposed. If he seeks to depict the Victorian Englishman as a moral and rational being, he must not forget what happened at Staley Bridge Wakes in 1850. But this, in turn, does not mean that he can eliminate interpretation, which is the lifeblood of history. Laymen, that is to say non-academic friends or friends from other academic disciplines, sometimes ask me how the historian goes to work when he writes history. The commonest assumption appears to be that the historian divides his work into two sharply distinguishable phases or periods. First, he spends a long preliminary period reading his sources and filling his notebook with facts. Then, when this is over, 
he puts away his sources, takes out his notebooks, and writes his book from the beginning to end. This is, to me, an unconvincing and unplausible picture. For myself, as soon as I've got going on a few of what I take to be the capital sources, the itch becomes too strong and I begin to write, not necessarily at the beginning, but somewhere, anywhere. Thereafter, reading and writing go on simultaneously. The writing is added to, subtracted from, reshaped, cancelled as I go on reading. The reading is guided and directed and made fruitful by the writing. The more I write, the more I know what I'm looking for the better I understand the significance and relevance of what I find. Some historians probably do all this preliminary writing in their head without using pen, paper or typewriter, just as some people play chess in their heads without recourse to board and chessmen. This is a talent which I envy, but cannot emulate. But I am convinced that, for any historian worth the name, the two processes of what economists call input and output go on simultaneously and are, in, pra in practice, parts of a single process. If you try to separate them, if to give one priority over the other, you fall into one of two heresies. Either you write scissors and paste history without meaning or significance, or you write propaganda or historical fiction and merely use the facts of the past to embroider a kind of writing which has nothing to do with history. This writing uh, example, I, I think, is very true of myself. Perhaps not everybody, but when you start writing, you, you read something and then you put it down. And then because that's put down, you go and read something else. And, you know, your writing sort of, it doesn't go from beginning to end like this, but it sort of starts here and it gets bigger that way and, and you jump around. That's what I was saying at the beginning of this course with I'm not going to do this chronological uh, view of history that goes from... A to Z, something like that. We're going to sort of go into the middle where we get the itch and then we're going to jump around to see where this takes us in world history. So it's more, uh, you know, subjective, but it's, it's more freer and natural, I think, and it might resonate with the mind a little bit more. I don't know. Let's see. Hopefully we don't fall into either of the two heresies of just something completely, you know, cut and paste or something completely fictitious. Uh, we'll come into these uh, with descriptive and normative. This is what I'm going to ask you in about five minutes at the end of the lecture. Descriptive and normative, there are examples here. Our examination of the relation of the historian to the facts of history finds us, therefore, in apparently precarious situation. Navigating, delicately, between the cilia of an untenable theory of history as an objective compilation of facts for the unqualified primacy of fact over interpretation and the chabdis of an equally untenable theory of history as the subjective product of the mind of the historian who establishes the facts of history and masters them through the process of interpretation. Between a view of history having the centre of gravity in the past and a view having the centre of gravity in the present. But our situation is less precarious than it seems. We shall encounter the same dichotomy of fact and interpretation again in these lectures in other guises the particular and the general, the empirical and the theoretical, the objective and the subjective. The predicament of the historian is a reflection of the nature of man. Man, except perhaps in earliest infancy and in extreme old age, is not totally involved in his environment and unconditionally subject to it. On the other hand, he is ne never totally independent of it and is unconditional master. The relation of man to his environment is the relation of the historian to his theme. The historian is neither the humble slave nor the tyrannical master of his facts. The relation between the historian and his facts is one of equality, of give and take. As any working historian knows, if he stops to reflect what he is doing as he thinks and writes, the historian is engaged on a continuous process of moulding his facts to his interpretation and his interpretation to his facts. It is impossible to assign primacy to one over the other. The historian starts with a provisional selection of facts and a provisional interpretation in the light of which that selection has been made, by others as well as by himself. He works both the interpretation and the selection and ordering of facts undergo subtle and perhaps partly unconscious changes through the reciprocal action of one or the other. And this reciprocal action also involves reciprocity between present and past. Since the historian is part of the present and the facts belong to the past, the historian and the facts of history are necessary to one another. 
The historian without his facts is rootless and futile. The facts without the historian are dead and meaningless. My first answer, therefore, to the question, what is history, is that it is a continuous process of interaction between the historian and his facts, an unending dialogue between the present and the past. What I do like uh, very much about this work is that uh, Carr brings it to a clear conclusion. He starts with a question, he takes you through a, a series of examples, and then you know he, he gives you this conclusion. It's not ambiguous. Yes, he does use you know, literary techniques and writing. It's not pure science, right? He doesn't start out and say, this is what I think, and I'll show you three examples. That's terrible. Nobody likes to read that. But he doesn't get lost. And he, he comes back to this question. If you were to read this answer, what is history? It's a continuous process of interaction between the historian and his facts, an unending dialogue between the present and the past. You wouldn't get that. It wouldn't make any sense to you if you read that at the start. But when you read this at the end of the chapter, hopefully you get this idea of, yeah, OK, that that makes sense because now you're understanding the historian is a subjective being who chooses and selects things and the idea of whether history can be um, completely known or just completely made up has also been debated but for Carr it's got to be somewhere in between just like human life and then you've learned about facts in the past when does the past become history and that's based on selection and then collective understanding which elevates it to that stage but not always because some things fall away and then you've got this uh, temporal idea this time idea in that we're always looking at the past this was Collinwood with his historical sort of reimagination or you have to get in there but we're always looking at the past from the present it's from the present that we look in to the past and when we do that we do that in the knowledge of our own episteme, our own values and things of the society we live in, and also of our own ideology and the things that we want to, to shout about or the things that we want to promote, you know. So that should make a little bit more sense to you now. That's chapter one of What is History. It's a fantastic book. I have an English copy of it if you would like to, to borrow it, or of course it's online. Um, I highly recommend you read as much of it as you can after this because uh, wonderful writing is car. Uh, wonderful writing. What I would like you to do now, so if I may, um, I would like to uh, quickly talk about your assignment if I put it here. And if I was really clever, you know, I would have spelled assignment correctly. Yeah. Um, and I would have prepared this in the... What you need to do for me, and uh, I would like you to try to put this somewhere on the uh, blackboard, there should be a place to upload this onto the Hanyang website, is I would like you to give me your thoughts on what we've done today. Now, obviously, if we were in class, you would be able to share your ideas and you will find that, you know, we have 70 odd people in the class. Everyone would have a different idea and interpretation. Everyone, a different thing would have... Uh, made a light bulb in their head right so you don't get that collective idea at the moment I'm sorry but try to find your own light bulb now you want to consider can't write, descriptive statements and normative statements descriptive statements are just facts it's like Wikipedia okay so E.H. Carr said dun, dun, dun. in the video Professor Tizard said this it's a descriptive statement. That's all it is. And the normative statement is subjective or opinion. E.H. Carr, in his chapter, The Historian and His Facts, said this. I think this. So your opinions, your interpretations are built on the facts there. You, if you only write this, okay, if you only produce uh, these, it'll be boring. As Carr says, it will be like reading Wikipedia, won't get anything out of it. However, if you only do this, then you fall into the other heresy. You go too far the other way and there's no grounding. OK, so just try to remember, well, this is what was said and this is how I'm interpreting it. Try to get that first and then build on it. 
these ratios don't have to be 50 50 it can be 50 50 60 40 70 30 20 80 anything that you like but you probably want both in there um, how do you present your work i would suggest uh, one of two ways you can write it so you open up a, a document just write down your ideas what you've done how you've interpreted this first lesson upload it the second thing that you can do if you like is you could do a video like i've done here and many of you might think jesus christ i'm not doing that of course but if we're in a situation of online learning and we're you know we're getting used to this this is the first time i've done this so i'm just trying to give you the uh, encouragement in case it helps because it might be something that you need to get used to doing because we don't know we might be in class in two weeks we might not so you're also welcome to do it that way if you like so you can write your assignment or you can put a video like this of your assignment where you go through it please try to focus on the quality don't make it too long you know if i have 75 pieces of work it takes me a long time to go just for this class uh it takes me a long time to go through them so please focus on the quality rather than the quantity don't try to impress me with the length try to impress me with what you're doing okay um there should be ways that you're able to upload that i'm not quite sure what happens with the blackboard but we'll try to sort it out okay um other than, let's say you have a week to do every assignment i think yeah so one would be like that other than that if you have any questions or comments please feel free to get in touch with me anytime you'll find uh my email uh on my super fun time happy snack at gmail.com any other serious problems zero one zero two one oh five nine three eight two uh happy to help you as much or however i can and please stay healthy please stay happy stay positive do what you can and i look forward to seeing you in person soon okay thank you very much goodbye